I have a problem, or at least I think I have a problem, a conversion problem specifically. My personal website, mikebyfulco.com, is where I publish articles and newsletters and podcasts and things that I create on the web. It is generally speaking the place where I try and send people to to get to stuff that I make. The reason I do that is probably a topic for another video, but I do think it is important to own your home on the web, and that's why I have one made for myself. There are two things that I use to track to make sure that my site is working as intended. One, is it getting traffic? Are people going to articles on my site? from Google, from other places. Generally speaking, that's been good and sort of steadily climbing over the years. The other one that has stopped lately and I think is broken is, are people subscribing to my newsletter? I publish a newsletter just about every week called Tiny Improvements, which is meant for startup founders and indie hackers and React developers who are interested in building products to learn from my experience. Hey, and while I'm at it, you should go subscribe. There'll be a link down below. You know how to find that. I've been writing newsletters for a few years now and it's been a lot of fun. I find it very satisfying. However, recently I've really seen a decline in people signing up for my newsletter and my mission today is to figure out why. So first let's start by taking a look at my site and I'll kind of pick apart some of the things that I think might be going wrong here. I share a bunch of different types of content on my site, but the two primary ones that I'm updating most often are newsletters and long form articles. Newsletters, I publish just about every week a newsletter going into something I'm interested in. This recent one is a JavaScript one. They have some content on the left here. There's a, there's a table of contents on the right and that maps to the headings on the page. Immediately, you'll see one of the things I think that we may need to take a look at here is this pop-up comes up on the site and it contains a call to action to get people to subscribe to the newsletter. There may be a few things going wrong with this. One is it may just not be compelling enough. It may seem like sort of spammy and people may be ignoring it. It's also entirely possible that people are submitting through this and it's not working. So we should go and check that. At the very bottom of each article, I'll actually go and dismiss this with no thanks. At the bottom of each article, I have a giant hero that says, hey, subscribe to my newsletter, ship some products that uh, matter. This is built with a form that submits to my ConvertKit uh, mailing list. It's a pretty basic HTML form that lives inside of a React component and should essentially do the same thing as the other pop-up when submitted. It's also possible that this is broken. I don't actually know that either one is broken necessarily, or maybe I'm having compatibility issues. But generally speaking, for quite a while, I was getting, uh, we'll call it one to five subscribers per day. And recently it's slowed to an absolute crawl. It's been something like zero or one a week. So like a seventh of the traffic I was getting prior. So we want to take a look at these two places. On newsletters, I have this pop-up. I have the hero that happens at the bottom of the page. And there's probably some other things to be introspective about here, like the design of this layout. Maybe this is something that just uh, conveys to people that it's the end of the article and they should navigate away. Maybe it's too aggressive. Maybe the wording isn't great. I can test a whole bunch of things here. Another thing worth testing is if I look at a long form article, so let me go back to my homepage and go to a recent article. You'll see here, these look largely the same. I have some content on the left. These tend to be much longer because they're walking you through how to do things. And then I have the same footer at the very bottom. So these are similar, but maybe what I want to consider here is adding a call to action on the right side, something in this area below the table of contents where as people are getting through the article, it's a reminder that they can subscribe here. The last thing I want to point out is the major call to action in my heading of my page is for my newsletter, Tiny Improvements. And this has yet another form where people can submit, other than my password manager, this is yet another form where people can submit to subscribe to my newsletter. And this is a little bit of a different call to action than the hero at the bottom of the other page or the pop-up. This one uses more social proof. So join 650 other product builders and it's a pretty simple call to action here. It's possible this form is broken, although I believe they all share implementation. It's worth diving into and seeing what's going on. So that's job number one. Let's pick apart, take inventory of everything that's there, and then we'll take a look at how things are implemented and start to form some hypotheses and build out some changes as a result. Okay, so let's take a look at PostHog, which is a product analytics tool that I use to take a look at how my site is performing. What I have created here is a little comparison of no thanks intense to uh, yes please intense on the pop-up that comes up for my newsletter on the site. What you're seeing here, the blue line, the top line here is people saying no thanks when presented with a little pop-up uh, that asks them if they want to subscribe. And the bottom line, the purple one, is people who say sounds great. This is going back as far as I can to 2023, grouped by week. And if we take a look at that, it looks like week over week, the sort of ratio of these things hasn't changed dramatically. Although you can see perhaps a dip in traffic from let's call it March to the beginning of July, overall volume is lower. So like if you imagine the height of these two bars added together, it's lower, but generally speaking, people are responding the same amount. So at the very least, I know people are, the ratio of these things performing is 
more or less the same now as it was uh, prior, and it's possibly even picking up a little bit, which is nice to see. So I'm at least confident that people are clicking on one thing or the other. I would love it if they click sounds great more, and maybe part of the thing I want to test here is maybe we can put a different copy on that pop-up or give it a different presentation. But at the very least, this part looks like it's working right. So let's jump into the code and take a look at what's going on there. Okay, let's start here. So let's look at the newsletter hero on my site. This is a great big banner that goes across the whole page and essentially has one simple form on it that asks for a first name and an email address. The implementation of this thing is maybe as you would expect a section that has some images and, and a bunch of presentation rules in it. So there's a bunch of CSS here and then a heading that's got this call to action and a subscription form on it. This subscription form, if I search the code on my site, this subscription form is used in a few places. So the good news is from a quick look through the site, everywhere I ask people to subscribe, I use this one subscription form. So we'll call that good software fundamentals. I only need to fix this in one place if it's broken. Let's go into the subscription form and take a look at what's in there. If I pull this guy up, this is a form that has two inputs on it and a button. So very simple form. It's presented in a few different places on the site, but all this does is ask people for their first name and email address. In its current implementation, what it's doing is submitting a form with an action to convert Kits API to the form that I use to ask people to subscribe. So this is a pretty like bog standard way to do convert kit subscriptions. And in fact, this is public code. So if you viewed my site today and you went to view source, you would see all this stuff. I don't really have anything to hide here if you're, you're anxious about that. If I scroll down here, there's a few things that are nice that this is pretty basic HTML. That's nice to see, but I have some hypotheses. There's some stuff going on here that I, I'm a little nervous about. So via ConvertKit's recommendation, I render a script on the page that does something. This is some JavaScript that ConvertKit wrote. I don't really know what it's doing and it's submitting to their form and I don't really know what's happening beyond that. So what I would like to do is track this form so that when it's submitted, I can see what's happening. Are people submitting? Are they providing correct contact information? Is the form submission failing? Is there times where it's unavailable or for whatever reason? Let's go figure that out. Okay, so jump forward a few commits and I've made some changes here. I actually took this from what was a pretty simple kind of HTML-ish form with some JavaScript that ConvertKit handles to something that's much more React-centric. So this is maybe more familiar if you've seen React for, uh, before. And I ripped out a bunch of the ConvertKit stuff and I put in a bunch of my own and ultimately we're still submitting a ConvertKit form, but I want to show the differences that I added here. First of all, this form now has a bunch of states that I track. So whether it's submitting, whether it was submitted successfully or whether there was an error, I'm doing that with some use state stuff within React. So if I hover over this, we can see I've got uh, a few use state calls here that track whether it was successful, whether it's submitting or whether I've had an error happen. But the next three things that are showing here are refs to elements on the screen. So this form ref, email ref, and first name ref are all tracking the two inputs and the form itself. That allows me to access the data inside of those. And then I've got this handle submission function that I wrote that does a few things now that weren't happening before. First of all, we're grabbing the email and first name that are in those inputs. If an email isn't here, we return. Uh, what I might add to this eventually is something like an error or a more useful message here. Uh, that'd be pretty easy to add in. And then I'm doing a couple of post hog calls. So I'm doing post hog that identify with an email and a first name. This is something I may or may not leave long term, but essentially what this does is it says, this is a person con confirming an action. I want to associate their sort of post hog session with this email address so that I can track whether this specific person had any problems. Uh, then I capture an event called newsletter subscribed using post hogs capture API. The capture API basically just lets you capture anything you're interested in, in terms of an event. So I can now create a query of graphs of when people subscribe to my newsletter from within post hog. And I can look at how these things trend over time. I'm passing a few things in here, the source, the email address they give me and the first name, the source I'm using as a way to uh, track which sub subscription form is being used on the page. So in that hero, the source might say something like newsletter dash hero in the pop-up, it would say newsletter pop-up and at the newsletter homepage, I might say newsletter home, for example. Then I'm doing some really simple stuff to take the email and first name and pass them into ConvertKit to track that down. I'm firing off a fetch request to a serverless API through Next.js, this API newsletter subscribe, which is server side, how I take this email address and, and uh, first name and send them off to ConvertKit and wait for a response. I'll show how this works in a minute. It's pretty straightforward as well. Around that, I have this set submitting true and false. And what that does is it allows me to disable the form while it's saving so people don't submit more than once. And then I checked the response from that. So if the response status comes back as something other than a 200, in other words, something other than a success, I render a little error on the page. 
I print out to the console so that I can go chase this down later on if I'm debugging myself. And then I do a set success of false, meaning this thing didn't actually work. And the success thing that I'm using on the page is used to render a success message at the end. So then there's a few cases. If I've run into an error, I render this error message saying, oh shoot, something went wrong. If you continue to have issues, please email me uh, and I'll get it sorted out. If they succeeded, then I render this success message with a cheeky little emoji in here. And the resting state for this page is the form that we saw before with a few small changes. So I'm no longer pulling in this convert kit JavaScript. I'm now also submitting the form using an on submit. This handle submission function allows me to run some JavaScript to do things like the post hog capture. And I also have this field set added now, which allows me to disable the entire form at once. So those are the changes I made here. Let's go in and take a look at this API function to see how newsletter subscribe works. This will probably look familiar if you've seen serverless functions in Next.js before, but let me walk through it anyway. I've defined a serverless handler, which grabs the requests that I'm sending to myself. So when I do a fetch slash API slash newsletter slash subscribe, it comes in here. First, it checks to see that I've gotten a post request. If not, I send an error. So then I go and try and subscribe. And to do that, I grab the email address and first name fields from the body of the request that came in that I'm essentially sending to myself. Then I take that information and I send it off to ConvertKit with another fetch. So this is how you tell ConvertKit, hey, post to this subscriptions URL for my form ID. I want to add a new subscriber. There's a few things you have to set here. Tell it that content type is application JSON to accept application JSON, pass in my API key, and then the body is shaped uh, like this to be able to accept the API key, and then this body will contain email address and first name. And that's all there is to it. Now I'm telling ConvertKit, go ahead and subscribe this person. I wait for a response from this. Right now I have it cast to an unknown. What I should probably do is create a type for the shape of data that, post uh, that ConvertKit sends back to me. But I'm not really doing much with this other than printing it, so I'm not really losing sleep over it. I check to see if this came back okay. If it didn't, then I send back the, res the response in a status. And if it did succeed, then I send it back as a 200. I don't really need to send anything to the front end to say that I've subscribed. There's also a case here to catch a, sort of a miscellaneous server-side error. So this would be if something went wrong within this code on my end, I render a 500 here too. And then the last little thing at the bottom here, this config with runtime edge means this function is running as an edge function rather than a standard serverless function. All that does is makes it way cheaper to run on Vercel's servers, which is where I host my site with Next.js. Okay, now let's jump back over to post hog. So now that I have this all wired up, I'm sending off subscription requests to ConvertKit and getting them back. I'm also tracking what happens within post hog. Now I have this newsletter subscribed event that I created with the post hog capture API. It tracks the person via email address and the screen they subscribed from, and as well as a bunch of other metadata that may or may not prove useful for me in the future. This gives me the page they subscribed from with the source, the email address that they gave me, and then their first name, which lets me verify at least that someone tried to submit this form with this information. If for some reason this wasn't making it into ConvertKit, I now have this to fall back on that I can go and manually add this if I need to. But what I'm really interested in seeing now over time, now that I have these, you can see these all came from my local host, so this is just me poking around, is once people su start submitting the form now in my production site, I'll start to see how often this happens and be able to look at this as a chart. This will let me actually see growth over time and be able to do a little bit better of a comparison of my growth week to week. Now that I have this data in post hog, I can create charts from it, I can see trends, and I can use this to make decisions. Okay, so let's bring it back and talk about what we've just done. I haven't actually created new functionality on my site yet, so to say. From the end user perspective, everything looks identical. But what I've done is I've gone and validated that in all three places where people can subscribe to my newsletter, I'm using the same segment of code. And that bit of code now is also sending data off to my analytics software so that I can see what's happening with it. This will let me see if people are just submitting less, if maybe errors are happening and they're not making it from the form on my site to ConvertKit. It'll let me start to test other things. So now that I'm measuring, the next thing I want to do is experiment with the content and the presentation of the call to action on this page. So this is the tricky thing, right? Now I need to kind of ingest the information and, and dissect it a little bit and make some decisions from there. What I think I'll probably do next is use PostHog's really cool A-B testing feature to be able to test different calls to action on the site. So I might change out the heading asking people to subscribe or the body text or the image that's rendered. And I might try a few different presentations to see if one causes people to respond better or not. I can now also start to do things like customization. So if the page is a React article, I can change the header to say, hey, React devs will really like this. Or I can say startup founders will really like this. Or if I started talking about knitting, I can put, hey, people who are into knitting really like this. It doesn't really matter. What I really like about using a product analytics tool is that I've collected data and I've validated that the data is coming in. Now I can use this data to make decisions that are at least informed before I was kind of shooting blind. So. 
We'll collect data for a few days. Uh, I'll take a look at this soon and we'll iterate from there. I would love to know what you think from here. So are there things that you're seeing on my site that I'm not? Is there something that you would do to test whether or not this is working that I haven't tried so far? Maybe you've got suggestions for what I should include as the copy on the page for the header and the button and the email and the things that I collect. I'd love to know what you think. Do you have any guesses as to what might be wrong? I honestly don't. Things just kind of stopped working at some point, so I'm certain there's something subtle that I'm missing, and I'd really like to chase it down. This is just an example of what I think good product iteration looks like. You collect data, you make decisions based on it, and sometimes we may even jump to just using our gut feel to try and guess what's next. This is step one. Step two will be making some changes, and we'll get to that next time around. Until then, my name is Mike Bifolco. This is Tiny Improvements. Hey gang, uh, Mike from the future here. It's been about a week since I filmed the first part of that and I kind of intentionally put some space here so that I could see what happened in the following days. And real quick, I wanna point out a few things that I've seen happen in the intervening time. First of all, it's been really helpful to have this subscribed event to listen to. Over the past week, a couple of people have subscribed to the newsletter on my website, or at least they thought they did. They submitted the form and it never made its way to ConvertKit. So something is definitely wrong there. And what I'm struggling with right now is that ConvertKit's API doesn't give me a lot of feedback and the documentation is lacking. In fact, to get to the latest version of ConvertKit's API, I have to apply for access. And I have, and it's been a week and I've heard nothing. I would have lost a few subscribers if I wasn't listening for these events. I've added those in manually, that's really nice. However, I think there's still more to be done around copy. For now, my plan is to keep an eye on this a little further and start making changes to the way I present uh, the call to action to get people to subscribe. We'll see what happens from there. Uh, thanks again for listening. This is Mike by Fulco. Tiny improvements. You know the thing. We'll be back for a part two on this one. Catch you soon. Bye.